very proud to be working for the governor. I think he's got us headed in the right direction, certainly coming back out of private industry in to do some more government work. Uh, very happy to do it for him. Unlike Kerry, I'm not a lifelong loser. I was uh, raised in the great state of Michigan, but certainly proud to be a loser now, living here, working here, been in the state for 24 years now. So spending about 20 years of, of my life in uh, the aerospace world, in aerospace manufacturing, most recently. Uh, certainly we went through some tough times, still are. Uh, you'll see here in just a minute kind of how that relates to what we're doing. But, you know, going through that in a small and mid-sized company and needing to develop the programs yourself to get you what we really needed, which was human capital. That's, that's where we were struggling put together those programs to make it work, and you'll see some of the results of that here in a minute. Um, I absolutely understand where most of you are right now, where you're coming from, and, and hopefully we can directly impact in a positive way uh, what it is that you need. So as I look out here, a lot of polo shirts, a lot of jeans, and I'm missing my days in manufacturing because most days i got to wear this stuff now. Uh, but it's all good. So we'll uh, kind of jump into this. And do, uh, do some background, kind of where we're at in the state. Some statistics, of course, with that. What is work-based learning? So we've all got a good understanding of that. By the way, that marketing piece that you guys have got here, this is, this is fabulous, really. I mean, there's some really good things going on around the state of Indiana, a lot of uh, neat programs and so forth. This, to, to work that out of here, is, that's phenomenal. I'd like to see that everywhere. So we'll talk about solutions to, to some of the issues you two folks are facing. We'll have a panel discussion. We've got some great collaborative uh, efforts that are going on in this area. We want to share those things with you. And then we'll do a quick working session to kind of work through the guidebook that you guys have on there as well, and then talk about the next step, of course. We're not, Carrie and I, my office, uh, not in the habit of meetings to set dates for more meetings. So, DWD's purpose. A lot of people know of the Department of Workforce Development. Typically, if we do that, we're thinking about our work one. Jim Heck is here and does a phenomenal job within the region, but a lot of people correlate work one with unemployment, and that's where people's minds go to. They don't understand the whole host of other opportunities that are there and the work that those centers do. Um, so, certainly, keep them in mind. At the state level, three main purposes. Oversee and administer the workforce operations, unemployment insurance program, which most of us are familiar with one way or another, and then new this past year, work-based learning and apprenticeship. Uh, last March, Governor Holcomb signed the executive order creating the office. Carrie and I walk, walked in on uh, Monday, June 11th, to stand this office up uh, with, with no budget, no staff, and nothing else. And I uh, think you'll see what we've done in a short period of time in the business. So first, uh, workforce operations, a lot goes on. JAG, many of you are familiar with that. Adult Ed, Work Indiana, Skill Up. Uh, who's your initiative for reentry? Anybody hear that? Higher? Okay, that, that has shifted, and we utilize that at Stark Industries. That has shifted out of just recently here in January from the Department of Workforce Development over to the Department of Corrections. So the Hoosier Initiative for Reentry is a, another small staff of about 15 throughout the state that work with uh, inmates, former inmates. Uh, in our area, they were working with the Veterans Court Initiative, and they helped to place and develop that relationship between former inmates and businesses. I hired people out of that program. It's a very successful program. We probably need a bunch more of that. The change now moving to the Department of Corrections is so that they can start working with people a lot earlier and have more effect on the programs and the training that these people are going through uh, while they're still a uh, member of the Department of Corrections. Next level jobs. Have you all heard of next level jobs? Okay. Here it is. We're getting ready for the next round of this. Hopefully coming out of this legislative session we'll get these dollars locked in. Um, but two different grants out of that. Workforce Ready Grant, the Employer Training Grant. Workforce Ready Grant goes to the individual. They can apply for free training in manufacturing.
manufacturing is, is one of those key economic sectors. The other one, the employer training grant, goes to the employer. So up to $5,000 per person, there's a $50,000 cap on that. But this is, I will say, very easy money. So there's an easy way to apply. There's like three steps involved in this. Uh, our staff at DWD will walk you through this. It couldn't be any easier, seriously. Uh, before joining last year, I took advantage of this program at North Star K Districts. And it was. I got online within about five minutes. I was pretty much done there. Somebody from DWD called me, walked me through the rest of it. Uh, and it is a reimbursable program. But definitely take a look at that. Unemployment insurance, again, we're back to lots of things that they're involved in. The work ones are our America's Job Center initiatives. You guys are very familiar with these, I would imagine, especially down here with Jim and his staff. They do an excellent job with that. So, uh, Indiana's 2023 high school graduation requirements. How many of you know that they have changed? A few more than what we normally, sometimes just like one hand that goes up, we're like, they've got to get this marketed. So this year's eighth graders, not only will they have to satisfy the requirements that are currently in place, but they've got some other things to do that too. So instead of me talking about, I'll bring my education expert up, Gary, and kind of walk you through. And what this means, it's coming at a very good time when we start talking about work-based learning and partnering with schools in order to get some of this stuff done. Good morning. So currently students who graduate high school have to pass a series of courses, either English, Math, Science, Social Studies, a combination of electives, health, and PE, um, and pass an I-STEP test in English and, and Math. So that's the, the graduation requirements that's been, I think, in place the last, what, 20 years or so. Um, with the, uh, the State Board of Education this past December passed these new graduation requirements, which are really focusing on not kind of checking the box of, of you know, I've passed the test, I've passed courses, but really demonstrating post-secondary and career competencies. So as a former educator, I'm super excited that we're actually giving students a chance to demonstrate what they're able to do rather than have a kind of a, a paper report of what they've done. So students still have to pass those combination of courses, so your core courses and your electives, but now they have two more opportunities to show what they can do. So the second box, if you will, is to learn and demonstrate employability skills. Students have to complete some sort of applied learning. That's going to be a project-based learning, a service-based learning, or a work-based learning experience. So students are getting out of the school building. They're working alongside employers and other community members and really engaging and interacting with their, their local community. The third box is the most secondary ready competencies. It's kind of a menu of options, if you will, of, of ways students can identify or demonstrate what they can do. Um, that could be a qualifying SAT, ACT, or ASVAB score. It could also be um, <clears throat> certifications in, in industry-recognized um, you know, areas and credentials. It could also be enrolled into an apprenticeship program or having um, dual credit that is transferable to a post-secondary. So lots of different options in, in which a student can kind of check that box as well and, and demonstrate those competencies. What we're going to do is, is share with you um, what we call a state earn and learn and how schools are kind of coming on board with these earn and learns and seeing how it's checking multiple boxes for students. Students are really getting a comprehensive work-based learning experience that is giving them credentials, that is giving them post-secondary credit, and it's, and it's really propelling them on to the next step in life. So, many of you have said these things, right? Need people today, if we get past that, I need people for long-term growth. Both of those things, I had a real issue getting product out the door on time on a daily basis because I needed people right now, today. But also looking at the company, there was a huge shift that I had to make from uh, business development to workforce development. Because again, human capital was the issue that I had. I didn't have machining capacity issues. I didn't have any other type of capacity issues. Uh, no problem with the funding end of it. It was, it was simply human capital. So over the next 10 years, a million plus jobs, that could be closer to 2 million the way that they're calculating this now from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, certainly 700,000 we know are going to need to be replaced. Those are baby boomer retirements. And then new jobs growth, whether that's internal to the state or new businesses that we're attracting into the state, about another 300,000 in there. So we've got our work cut out for us. 
at any given moment, we've got between 80 and 100,000 job openings throughout the state of Indiana that can't be filled. So, the human capital issue. Any other military folks in the audience? Get the fluff thing, right? The bottom line up front. Uh, that's just it. Not enough qualified people. There's bodies out there, but whether or not they're qualified uh, is a whole other thing. So, unfilled job openings and the inability to take on new business is where most of us are at or have been. So, if we look at this, here's a typical journey of a high school student if we're talking about getting out into college or university and a bachelor's degree. Bottom line there is about 10% are finding good jobs or what we would consider to be careers right now. If we break it down for Indiana, this is part of the ugly stuff I told you we were going to talk about, but it's, this is where we really are at. So about 80,000 high school uh, graduates, you say potential graduates every year, because as you can see right off the bat, about 9,000 are not even graduating. They're, they're dropping out before they're walking the stage and getting their diploma. And this, we can send this whole thing out if we want to afterwards, uh, so you guys don't have to take a bunch of notes and pictures and stuff. I caught that quicker this day. Usually I'm halfway through it, about the 10th person I see taking a picture of it, then I remember. Anyways, uh, so about 25,000 say they have absolutely no plans beyond high school except get a job at some time. When I went out to schools and I had relationships with six different school corporations, I'd get into classes or big lecture halls with students, and you start asking them what they're going to do. That shrug of the shoulders, right? Which is okay if we're talking to freshmen and some sophomores. As we get to juniors, we don't want to see so many shoulders doing that. Uh, definitely, as they're seniors, we don't want to hear kids say, I don't know. But I saw a lot of them say, I don't know. And when I'm at schools in February and March, when we're talking about 90 days or less of graduation, you have seniors say, I have no clue what I'm doing. That's problematic, right? So, 45,000 head off to a college or university. Uh, only 30,000 finishing successfully within six years. So there again, bottom line, we've got 62% of our high school seniors six years from graduation with nothing <coughs> beyond high school. That's a serious issue. 30% of our college freshmen within the state of Indiana and our state schools are dropping out first year. That's a problem, too. Many of them with that death that they've incurred already, so that when we are trying to right track them, that becomes even more difficult because they've got that, how do they finance going forward in the right direction? So these are things that we've got to be thinking about before we get to this point. Adults, how many knew that we had almost half a million Hoosiers without their high school diploma? Give those, yes. Because we're working this stuff every day. Every day. Um, that's an issue, but then 50% of those that we finally get enrolled in adult ed are below a sixth grade level. Again, training can they do, can they understand? So we've got to kind of skill them up first before we get to the point where we're, we're working on that kind of training. You'll see more details there. So, after all that, do and gloom. Now, how do we set people up so that they can succeed? This is an interesting statistic that was uh, last year. So, Strata Education Network, they're actually based here in Indiana, in Indianapolis. Uh, they service the country and beyond doing these types of things. From what resources or people did you get advice about the major or field that you were going to study? And this is out of about 22,000 people, age 18 to 65. Number one by far, work-based sources were rated helpful, 83%. But only 20% said they were getting that's where the disconnect is that, that we feel, and that's where we think that, that you folks can start to help with providing that solution, which is getting employers interacting more so at the secondary school level. So the office, again, stood up last June. Three major objectives, keeping it simple. We like things simple, right? Coordinate efforts with the U.S. Department of Labor to expand registered apprenticeships throughout the state of Indiana. Number two, develop and again implement, so that we're not just meeting about this stuff, we're actually out doing it, implementing a framework of work-based learning pathways. The third thing, probably the most important, is that P3 or public-private partnership, which is one of the reasons we're all here today, to try and pull business and industry together with education, whether we're talking secondary or post-secondary. So what is work-based learning? Different people have different definitions of this. For us and in our office, 
And with our experience, we can't have a one-size-fits-all solution to work-based learning. Our state representative for uh, registered apprenticeships with USDOL, John Delgado, phenomenal guy. He's been doing it for 32 years. He'd probably love everything to be a registered apprenticeship. Not everybody can fit into being a registered apprenticeship. So we've got multiple pathways, starting with job shadowing. The robust job shadowing program works wonders with exposing both children and adults to the world of working. Career and tech ed within our high schools, perfect. Internships and capstone courses. So when we talk internships now from our office, it's not the traditional summer six to eight week internship that we're talking about. Yes, those are phenomenal, but we need to be doing that work 12 months out of the year. We need to look at micro internships, so the short term and then even virtual internships. When we start talking about communities that are more rural based, we've got to find a way to get these people, uh, especially our youth, more involved with the possibilities that are out there. So during that, doing that virtually and using technology is a big help. Adult education, you'll see where I took an adult ed class uh, when I was at Stark Industries, coupled that with OJT and had a totally different outcome than what they were looking at. Our state earn and learns, that is, if you will, our state level apprenticeship. So it's not a US Department of Labor registered apprenticeship, but it's more of a state apprenticeship. We have to use different words than apprenticeship, and everybody's used to apprenticeship, but last year the state legislature uh, made sure that when we use the word apprenticeship, especially dealing with our youth in, in the secondary setting, um, that can only mean U.S. registered apprenticeships. I don't know if any other states have done that, but we did it. So anyways, our state urban learner learners, we call them SEALs, uh, fit into that. And then, of course, the registered apprenticeship, often thought of as kind of the gold standard if you will, for work-based learning in, in that type of training. Most people associate that with the union training, and that's it. We have now, in Indiana, just uh, within the last month, we're, we're over a 1,000 different occupations in, in the state of Indiana in, in different programs in, in registered apprenticeship. So all walks of life, all kinds of positions and jobs that certainly fall into so, here, the stigma. We deal with that with community college and ID Tech. A lot of people think of that and community college as something less than, right? I mean, it's out there, and we will continue to deal with that for a long time, I'm sure. Work-based learning, sometimes just coupled with career and tech ed. That's just for those people. You know, that's just for the shop folks. Uh, that's just for the people who get in building trades. Work-based learning is for everyone. And I can tell you, coming out of the aerospace industry, we have graduated enough theoretical engineers. Um, I get stuff almost on a daily basis coming from somebody that we know, sat in a classroom, earned a degree, never went and got their hands dirty, never did an internship, and now they're working somewhere in a cubicle and they're designing stuff that you physically can't make. Work-based learning is for everybody, even our engineers. Um, we know that out of that million plus, that about half of those jobs are going to require something less than a four-year degree. So we're talking certificates, technical certificates, associate degrees, and industry certifications. Uh, manufacturing careers, there's that stigma around that, right? They're very low-paying jobs. I mean, in this, you know, one of the best things we did, which you'll see later, one of the pathways I had at Stark was open houses. And the open houses were wonderful for the kids that came in. More importantly, for so when they come into a facility and they see what's going on and they start talking to employees that are in their 20s making quite a bit of money, again, run around in jeans and t-shirts having fun, um, we kind of change that perception, but it, it, it takes a while. It's a continuous effort to get through the stigma of several years ago. So here's how we change these things. That public-private partnership, a little bit of P3 intervention with work-based learning is how we change the net. I don't see us doing it any other way. If we continue down the same road expecting those different results, it's simply not going to happen. And this is where I'm saying that the new graduation pathways couldn't come at a better time. Because I think that is, in some cases, we've had school corporations that have kind of stiff-armed companies, and we've had companies stiff-armed school corporations. That still exists in certain places, but in this way, we're almost forcing that marriage, right? Everybody's kind of coming to the table because they certainly need one another. Our adults. So a lot going on on this little infographic, but the middle you can see there, the status at entry, 
41% are not in the labor force out of our half a million adults. That's about the same because we run about 40% of those 9,000 students that are dropping out every year. They don't enter the workforce either. So it's not like we've got 9,000 high school students dropping out because they had to go get a job to help support the family. Some of them do. But 40% of them are doing nothing when they graduate or, excuse me, drop out of high school. Assessed education level, that's our 47 or nearly 50% are below 6th grade. And then age, almost half are between 25 and 44. So some pretty important numbers there to kind of demonstrate where we're at with that half a million. The solution that we're working on with the adults, uh, in the past it was, <coughs> let's get you your high school equivalency first. Then we'll see what's next after that. Now the model is really integrated education and training where we're doing that high school piece simultaneously or sometimes on the backside if we can, again, depending on, on what grade level they're assessed at, that we can actually work on uh, the skills to get a job, a good paying job, at the same time that we're taking care of that high school equivalency. One of the best examples of this is the Mike Cook pathway. Anybody hear of it? Come up in Bloomington Cook. So they have done just this. What they did is they looked at, they had a bunch of openings that they could not fill and wondered why that was. Well, one of the boxes you had to check in the application process was that you had your high school diploma. When they took a look at their area, they found that they had 23,000 adults that were never going to come work for them because they couldn't check that box. So now Cook says, no high school diploma, fantastic, come work for us because we're going to skill you, give you a job, and we're going to send you to school during the week while you're at work, they're actually doing this and getting their high school equivalency. Plus, they've partnered with Ivy Tech to go on to beyond the certifications that they're getting, but associate's degrees, they'll even pay for bachelor's degrees and beyond. Absolutely. Yeah, because that's what they, they get stuck in that. We talk to kids about that, too, even the ones in high school. So we've got a lot of pockets of that generational poverty that they're in that cycle. And we've got to be able to help break that at some point in time. So, we're having some success with this. Almost 5,000 high school credentials a year. That ranks us third best. Just 5,000. That's a lot. And we're doing a good job. 5,000 gets us third best in the entire country. California and Florida are the only two states that are doing more with adult ed and getting high school equivalencies than they can. That's good, but it's also scary. So if we look at my math at the bottom there, that 9,000 is our dropouts that we've got. We're still net in the wrong direction. We've got to get after that 9,000 at the same time that we're, we're working on these calls. So I'll have Carrie come up now and kind of run through some of these things and how they will relate to certainly uh, secondary education, but most of the work that we're doing is secondary, post-secondary, and even for adults. and I get to share results. So when we talk about work-based learning, knowing that you know, new graduation pathways have been placed out in front of our eighth graders, um, we could have some great programs available for them, so that would be a great apprenticeship program or state earning or work-based learning opportunity. Um, but if there's no foundation built for that, then we can't just expect students to happen to fall into these experiences. So really looking at, at building that, that base block of, of the industry awareness all the way through the actual career education and training for a specific career, knowing that this is going to be the entire package that a student has to experience. When we talk about work-based learning, it's not just that event. It's not the event of being an intern or an event uh, of going and, and, and doing a project-based um, application learning. It, it's really a continuum of events, so students are going to be able to kind of uh, ramp in and out of, of work-based learning through their middle school and high school careers. When I talk to educators, we talk about kind of that eighth grade space of, of students being mandated through some uh, recent legislation to do some career exploration. But if, if we're waiting until eighth grade to start those conversations with students, it's too late. 
as eighth grader students are choosing which classes they're taking as high school students, and really that's going to open the door or close the door for lots of career opportunities. So if we wait until that sixth grade space to really start talking about what it is that you want to do after high school, we, we miss the boat. So really backing a lot of these conversations down to your, your early middle school and, and late elementary school and, and getting involved from the industry level with those students is going to be key. But when we talk about how to kind of build out the five-year program, knowing that those experiences have happened already in elementary and middle school, then these are some examples of how we can help uh, students in schools kind of package what work-based learning looks like for them. We'll talk about that continuum going back to the wheel. Uh, learning about work is kind of that first piece, and, and I, I give shout outs to Junior Achievement all the time, so I, I love the, the piece that you have here. My daughter was changed by Junior Achievement, so uh, I'm a firm believer in, in what you do. And JobSpark is an event that Junior Achievement has launched in um, Indianapolis in that area. Do you guys do one similar down here? Okay, perfect. So, so Junior Achievement is a huge, um, proponent of, of helping students understand what, what careers are available in their area and what those careers look like. If you haven't gotten involved um, with, with JobSmart down here, I'm sure your junior achievement people would definitely uh, want to have a conversation with you today. But um, in, in this presentation, there's a link. But the junior achievement JobSmart is an opportunity for students to really experience hands-on learning of, of what it looks like as, as you know, someone working in a CNC, um, you know, on a CNC machine, or someone working as a dental hygienist. They can really see what that looks like and, and what the day-to-day -day job may be. So this is a great event that's happening all over our state. Going back to that wheel, the second piece is learning for work. And this is where students are actually kind of the first time moving out of the high school space or out of the school space and, and applying and, and learning and, and figuring out what it is that's going to look like. So job shadows, uh, mentorships, uh, when I was in schools, a lot of things that we did were the, uh, the work-based problem-solving and industry tours. So we had um, students who were working in our basic, our, our CAD class. They were learning the computer-aided design piece of that. Uh, we had a local employer who was um, with the surveyors, uh, a surveyor's office, and he needed some CAD work done. What we were able to find was that our students were able to do that low-level basic CAD work for him. Students were now applying real-life skills to work that he needed. And it was, a, it was a mutual win for, for both our students and our, our local employers. So um, those types of, of programs, I mean, the schools have that all the time. And if you can get involved in, in simple ways of, you know, a real life problem that you're having at, at your, your local um, company and, and sharing that with a high school student to see if they can, they can help to alleviate maybe what those problems may be, it's a win-win. Another piece is the industry tour. So our high school students would go on an industry tour. They would take a career assessment. They would figure out maybe what career clusters they may want to pursue, if that's going to be healthcare or construction trades or manufacturing, whatever it may be. We were able to then set up industry tours. So students on this one would go on the construction tour. They would go to the Associated Builders and Contractors where they would learn what it meant to be trained for a career. So what it meant to be trained as an electrician or a pipe fitter. And then they would go to two different employers. So uh, in, in this example, it's Ryan Fire Protection and Gaylor Electric. They would work alongside kind of building these, um, these templates of what would actually be taken out into the field and installed. And they would work alongside someone doing this work every day. They would be able to kind of figure out what the day in the life looks like if you're an electrician or a pipe fitter and, and really have those conversations. You know, how much money do you make? That's the first question the kid asks. Um, and, and have those conversations with these people and see what see what this career may look like for them. And really, it's a win-win if, if a kid goes on a construction tour or an industry tour and realizes, you know, I, I want to go into construction, this is what I want to do, then the kid wins. The kid goes on the construction tour and realizes they have no interest in doing this at all, then the kid wins. So really, we're helping to identify what that next step is for a student. And this happens typically in the sophomore year, so when your students are being able to decide what that next step for their junior and senior back to the wheel learning through work. This is that first opportunity where students are, are giving like that, what we consider, you know, work-based learning. They're going out, they're working alongside someone on a regular basis, they're doing internships, um, clinical experiences, uh, instructional worksite learning. One other aspect of, of learning through work is having someone from the industry come into the classroom and teach the curriculum. Uh, I was at Noblesville High School and we had a Project Lead the Way course in biomedical science. And biomedical science, in order to teach that as a, as a high school teacher, you have to have kind of the credential. You don't have to be a cardiologist to teach it, but you have to have the credential of kind of understanding biomedical science. 
part of that curriculum is, is talking about EKGs and being able to understand what the heart uh, rhythm is doing and what that equates to in terms of, of a person who's experiencing some sort of cardiac arrest. So as a teacher, I can definitely maybe explain that the best that I can, but I don't really have any real world experience on what that looks like. If I'm talking with someone who is in cardiac arrest, I, have, I really don't have that experience as a teacher in most cases. So I was able to um, welcome Dr. Lambert into the classroom, who is a, a cardiologist in the Noblesville area. He was able to transform that curriculum from me standing and talking to my students about what it, what it meant to be in cardiac arrest to Dr. Lambert actually explaining what an EKG meant, giving <coughs> EKGs to my students and helping them diagnose what was happening, and then taking them to his cath lab and, and, and realizing that when a, a person is in you know, heart failure, that this balloon or this stent, how this works actually within the human body. And that changed the entire world for my students and, and the entire perception of that piece of the curriculum. So, so those types of opportunities are, are fabulous opportunities for industry experts to come in and bring the curriculum to life for students. As Daryl mentioned earlier, that internship piece is, is not just typically that six to eight week summer internship that, that um, ultimately has kind of become the, the, the method that we help our students go through. But being able to break it down into a micro-internship. So this is kind of an example from uh, the New Albany area and one of the career um, centers down there. Um, they take their coursework and they break it down into like two weeks of learning of the coursework and then two weeks of applied learning as an intern. So uh, if, for example, the automotive piece, students are learning the braking system and then they go doing a two-week internship um, at, a, at a local um, car, car dealership and, and they apply those skills and they're working alongside people in, in, in the industry. And they do that throughout the car system. So the electrical system, the, the internship, the uh, exhaust system, and the internship. So it's really breaking it down into chunks and applying that learning throughout the whole cycle. That last piece of the wheel is learning at work and that's kind of the gold standard when we talk about, you know, the registered internships or the state earn and learns. Um, if you're familiar with the DOL registered apprenticeship, like Daryl mentioned, it's a tried and true, kind of the gold star. Um, method. We're looking at these five pieces, the, the business involvement, the OJT related instruction, rewarding students for skill gain and the national occupational credential. So that reward for skill gain, as, as my experience as an educator, is kind of that aha moment for students. I had a student go through their first year of a registered apprenticeship as a senior in high school. And um, he was going through plumbing. And he, he was one of my students and he kept trying to get an appointment with me and he really needed to talk to me. I thought there was something you know, that wasn't going right, that we had to figure out. And so finally we were able to meet up and he, he was just so excited because he got paid a quarter more because he knew how to install a laboratory. And he was just sitting across the table from me dumbfounded. He's like, they're paying me more because I can do that. And I said, yeah, yeah that's, that's how it works. And uh, he said, you know, I have had to prove that I can do things all throughout my high school career and no one's ever paid me more. No one's ever given me you know, more kudos for doing that. I've had to demonstrate my entire life that, you know, through tests or through homework or through this or that, that I know the material and I can do it, but now they're really rewarding me for that. And so that was a huge moment for my high school kid, and, and, and it changed his perception of lifelong learning. The more he learns, the more valuable he becomes to, to his employer. So that was a huge aha moment for my student. And, and you know, he, is, uh, he has gone on, he's finishing his apprenticeship now, and, and um, definitely found his passion in plumbing. So when we talk about the state earn and learn, the, the, still, the, the five components are still the same. We're still looking for the business involvement, the OJT, related instruction, rewarding for skill gain. But if you look back to that registered apprenticeship program, we're focusing on the registered program on a national occupational credential. What that means is that you're going through and you have a credential once you've completed your plumbing apprenticeship that you completed a plumbing apprenticeship. What we're looking here as a state earn and learn is maybe not the two to four year commitment um, it could definitely be a two to four year commitment, but really looking on those industry skills and credentials that are valued within the industry. So if that's a, a 12 week CNC machining certification, then that's what we build that, that registered, or I'm sorry, the state earn and learn with. Uh, we're really focusing on quick credentials, um, skills that are relatable to what employers need. So when we, we talk about the, the programs that are, that are built, they're still structured and scalable, but they're flexible and employer driven. So if, um, we'll share some examples. So if a, an employer needs, like I said, a CNC machining or they need uh, a, a welding um, 
personal dwelling certifications, that those are, are, are available and you can create a program that couples instruction with on-the-job training so that you get someone who has the skills and, and abilities to do this you are also going to talk a little bit about this process. <coughs> Let's talk about the boring slide. So. We wanted to make sure that we had in place a process so that when we said we've got a certified skater and learn has some meaning to it. Again, we didn't want to get ourselves into an area where people were looking at registered apprenticeship and then this again being something that would be less than, right? Um, so the only thing that typically is less than is, is the amount of time that it may take in the, in the cost to go through a state or and learn. So anyway, so the needs assessment, uh, we're going to go through some of that today with you folks. Verification of key economic sector alignment, again, limited resources. Uh, on our end, we want to make sure we're sticking within those. Depending on demand data, each region can be a little bit different, but primarily throughout the state, we've got six key economic sectors. Manufacturing is one of those. Legal compliance kind of speaks for itself. Solution development, that's where we're really starting to key in on what are those skills that we really need and how do we get after that through the OJP component and the related instruction. This is where we're also looking at any industry certifications or required licenses that we can embed within the training. Education and training resources that the company is already working with an education provider, whether that's secondary or post-secondary, fabulous. We're not here to force anybody in one direction or another, um, but if they need help in pulling that partnership together, we certainly will look at that. Uh, conformance requirements, knowledge and competency examination, skills examination, how do we know that we're getting what we're after? We've got to be able to test for those things. The partnership plan. This again, you go back to the, almost one of the first slides that I showed, we're not concerned with just today, but actually growing that pipeline and making sure that we're filling that long term. So we're looking for both adult sources and youth sources of that, measured outcomes, what are those metrics, how does the employer let us know that, and then the very last thing is that funding Many of these things do not have to be expensive, and they're not expensive. A lot of people think that when we start to get into this type of training, I'm going to be spending boatloads of money. We've had people come to us with their hand out first. They're more interested in how much money uh, can be given to a company to do something like this versus <laughs> let's really get after what the problem and the solution is. Documentation package, small, medium, and large companies we've worked with uh, depends on where they're coming from, the staffing that they have, do they even have a really robust application process, do they know how to create the handbook and so forth. Uh, if so, fabulous. If not, we have some of these documentation packages already put together that we can help people with. Solution examples. Um, the, the first one that we're given here is uh, within the healthcare sector, but we're showing it so that you can see the flexibility in this and exactly how it was developed. And Gary will talk about the one that you're going to see here and how it differentiates a little bit from one that we did uh, with another company, again, right to the skill level and the skills that they were after. So this was the first earning room that we were able to build out. Let me tell you a little bit of background about healthcare. Um, students who are in high school have some opportunities to go to a career center and get some really exquisite opportunities to apply learning. Um, what that meant for me at, at Noblesville High School was that I could send about 3 to 5 percent of my junior and senior class, a, a total of 3 to 5 percent of my junior and seniors, um, to the Career Center to get that experience. And so in healthcare in, in Hamilton County, that was not meeting the needs of my industry. So I was able to send about three students on to a, a CNA training program at the Career Center. And those students will go through a year at the Career Center and get their CNA and some medical terminology and be able to work in the field of healthcare as a CNA upon graduation or as, as moving into their senior year. And those three students had an, an amazing experience. But again, that wasn't moving the bar for my industry and my, my local needs. So what we were able to do was create a program where students were able to stay at the high school and get that training. And instead of taking a year, got it in a semester. I was able to move the bar from sending three kids to the Career Center to now 60 kids going through and getting the same training. So just by changing the location of where these students were able to, to get the training offered a, a new perspective to a lot of students who may not be able to attend the Career Center. What we've done is take that a step further. 
So students are going in the semester of, in the state earn and learn. Students in the first semester of their junior year are getting a CNA, they're getting a phlebotomy and Link Six Sigma certification, and then that's coupled with work-based learning the second semester. So students are working as a CNA, being paid as a CNA, but now getting deliberate job shadow experiences in other fields of healthcare. They're able to see what a radiologist technician does or a, an EKG technician or an RN or a hospital administrator. They're able to see and job shadow those positions and those types of careers in healthcare. Then as a senior, they're able to go on with the QMA, additional certifications, and again, that, that work-based learning that's really deliberate and embedded. Talking about this because we changed the model of what a year-long course looked for high school kids. We've backed it down into intensive training and semesters with certifications that are now making them able to work in the industry while they're learning more about what that field may look like. So students are, are getting graduating high school with seven industry-recognized certifications, over 1,000 hours of on-the-job training, and then up to 27 transferable credits into post-secondary programs. So really this is, if you think back to those high school graduation requirements and the boxes we're talking about checking, this is checking boxes two and three. We're getting credentials, we're getting certifications, and we're getting that work-based learning experience. How this looks in manufacturing and welding. Uh, this is an example in welding. This is one of our schools in Madison who has, has really um, kind of embraced what a, what a state earn and learn in welding may look like. So they're looking at Again, a, a full year of welding with um, MIG and stick um, certifications and then on-the-job training or, or OJT um, as, a, as a junior. As a senior, they're getting the, uh, the next level of, of the TIG, structural and technical welding. Again, more OJT. And then at the bottom, you can see students are graduating with 36 transferable credits. They have credentials to do the jobs that need to be done in their area, and they have uh, five industry recognized certifications. So students can leave with really that trajectory of what they want to do next, if that's going right into the industry and, and applying those skills, or if it's going on to post-secondary, they have a, a really great start with that. This is an example of, again, Madison, Indiana, has really embraced the welding and manufacturing. This is what their manufacturing uh, state earn and learn looks like. So coupling OSHA and MSSC in their full year, first year training as, as a, a junior, um, with on-the-job training, and then the certifications that are packaged in the senior year, industrial technology, um, concentrating in um, industrial mechanics, measurement materials, so those NIMS certificate, uh, certifications, safety and job planning, and benchmark work layout. So students are getting, again, 39 transferable credits, six industry recognized certifications, and these two, the welding and the manufacturing, are on a rotating basis, and this is how we work the schedule out. So it really is industry coming to the table saying, These are, this is the, the need that I have, and let's figure out how to get those in the, the hands of, of your students. And so really it is that public-private partnership coming together and making this work for students and their industry. Daryl's going to talk a little about his experience to start. And I know we're running a little over. We'll get us back on time today, so I, I apologize. I think we have a little to start, too. So <coughs> this I put up here just so we can see again from a small and mid-sized business. A lot of people, again, they go back to that dollar and they say, boy, we need a lot of staff. We need in order to make these things work. So classroom visits, Carrie talked about that earlier. We would go in, myself and the owner, go in and teach curriculum and actually get into the shop with our CNC machining students and, and work with them. The benefit there, and everything is time, right? So I know time is money as well, but really no dollars in doing that other than our time. That starts that relationship development. And again, we're taking that holistic approach to how are we doing this and how are we making a dent in, in what it is that we're after. So, those classroom visits, starting that relationship building, was crucial. And it paid off for us big time. Open houses, low dollar. Pizza, chips, pop, whatever the kids may need. Um, I don't like eating that stuff. They do. <coughs> so providing that, inviting kids plus parents to the open house was important. Uh, we'd give them a tour. Kids would go off with the owner. They'd make some customized Stark Industry fidget spinners on some CNC machines. And the parents would go and listen to a boring PowerPoint with me. Um, but at the end of that, the parents understood what was available to their children as they were going through school, what was offered to them from an educational standpoint, work standpoint, and really how successful they could be in an industry like manufacturing. Completely opened their eyes to that. Um, so it was an excellent time to have the parents in there as well. Job shadowing. We did it for both youth and adults. And I implemented job shadowing because of the second person that I hired out of the 12-week CNC machining course, 
up there that said, eh, this is just not what I thought it was going to be. So we lost somebody, and we spent time onboarding them, doing some initial training within that first 30 to 45 days, and we spent 4,500 taxpayer dollars through a 12-week CMC course at, at Ivy Tech. <coughs> job shadowing piece was very important to have them come out as adults. If you're going to go through any kind of training like that, you ought to go job shadowing. So more of that that can be done uh, with our work ones, the better off we're going to be. Uh, students, having them come in, high school students, and job shadow. And that can be something that lasts an hour, three hours, a whole day. Maybe they go to various locations in the week. But again, make it purposeful too. Any of these things that we're talking about, you've got to be able to deliver the right message kids when they come out in job shadow or intern, whether they have a good experience or a bad experience, they're telling everybody. So we've got to make sure that they're good experiences. Even when we job shadowed at start, I made sure I had them coupled with the right people that, that were in there. Some are better communicators than others. Um, you understand what I'm saying? So, internships. College and high school internships. We use Connexus. We're actually one of the 23 companies that helped write that Connexus internship program uh, what, five or six years ago, whenever that was. Uh, worked real well for us. Work study, again, working with our, our local uh, school system to bring kids in. No dollars for us there. Adult Ed with OJT, I'll talk about that in a second. And then I started developing our first state and learners uh, while I was there, too. So the top one up there, that adult DWD program, was a 12-week CNC machine. I would typically go in and visit sometime during the 12 weeks, kind of pitch coming to work for us. Then I started going in the first day. And I'd say, who here wants a part-time fixed duration job for the next 12 weeks? Had some good takers, first class, second class. Third class didn't because they were afraid they were going to lose out on their benefits, and that took some diving into to ensure them that they weren't losing any of their benefits while they were in class. But having them come work for 20 hours a week during those 12 weeks, Every one of them that went and did that became the best in the class, no doubt, because they're getting 20 more hours of experience with people doing the job. And then you can see I had 100% full-time employment retention rate for the students who did that. Totally different outcome, throwing 20 hours a week for 12 weeks. In I mean, it's kind of common sense, I think. Uh, doing that, setting the program up, was a wonderful thing. Our high school kids going through the uh, internship program, 86% higher retention rate for those eligible students coming out of that. One thing that I will say, especially with manufacturers here, whatever your company culture is, don't give that up because we're just want more bodies to come in the door. They were doing that at start when I got there, and the owners thought I was crazy when I said we're going to stop doing that. Um, we have people come in with 10 to 20 years of experience that I wouldn't let them hire because they didn't fit the they were going to come in and cause all the other problems that we know come along with this thing. We got to a point where the shop hoppers wouldn't even apply to them. So we kind of developed that culture and within the community, you know, the culture was actually developed in the two-car garage with Jeff and Lori Stark when they started the business 25 years ago. Maintaining that culture today is, is crucial. And that's what helps maintain longevity in the people that are there. Turnover rate, you can see, 3 to 5%. Most people would kill for 3 to 5 percent. Okay. That's because of the culture, because of the pipeline, and because we moved people through there in a very deliberate way instead of just, again, inviting more bodies into it. So don't give up on your company culture when we're talking about looking for these uh, problems. Last five years, workforce doubled, sales tripled. Doing very well. Doing international work as well, uh, both in the commercial and defense industries. So, but it's because of the human capital.